this is a crazy world. Uh, when we did this cup uh, last time, there were like 40 people here. And so maybe because it's June and it's so pleasant out and nobody wants to come, so whatever works is fine. I want to welcome you. I really want to uh, share information with you this morning, and I'm glad you've taken time out of your day to come join me. My name is Susan Graham, and I have a law practice. It's called uh, Senior Edge Legal. All we do is represent people anticipating retirement or in retirement, trying to help them figure out how to manage things for the rest of their life while life is great, and then what happens if it doesn't work out that way. This is one part of estate planning that most people approach this way, and that's long-term care. I'm not going to need it. Um, my father-in-law's version, he was just going to shoot himself. So we're going to adjust that as well as when you die. That's the only guarantee I can give you. You are going to die. Me as well. So that's traditional estate planning, but we're going to talk about this other stuff as well. Because unfortunately, as we pass age 65, you have a 70% chance of needing care before you die. That's in your home, assisted living, or nursing homes. And those are expensive. Care in your home is $20, $25 an hour. Assisted living, my clients are paying $4,500 on average a month. Skilled nursing care is $8,000 a month. I just talked to a client yesterday who told me that their friend is paying $10,000 a month. Uh, so these are just breathtaking numbers, and we're going to talk about how do you plan for that as well as other things. I want to go through this packet that you received um, so that uh, we're all on the same page because um, uh, there's some useful information in here. First of all, on uh, this side with the green sheet underneath it, um, there's two pamphlets, one about my law practice and another one about uh, being a certified elder law attorney. I'm one of about 500 nationwide. Uh, I'm very proud of that designation because you have to have practice in this area and pass a certain test and do all kinds of other stuff. There's a green sheet. I'll show you how to fill that out a little bit later on in terms of I'd really appreciate it if you evaluate me and also if you want to visit with me I'll show you how you can accomplish that. There's two other documents, a living will and a health power of attorney and a financial power of attorney. Those are really useful for everyone to fill out. So if you don't have one, these are forms you can use for yourself. I'll talk about those later. You can also make copies, give them to all the friends you have. And then on the other side, there's a little bit of information about me. Um, I'm not going to go into how many degrees I have and how long I've been doing this or that. If you care, it's written down here or you can go to my website. I put out a blog twice a month. It's a newsletter. And it, I'm old. You can tell I'm old. But that's really just an electronic newsletter. I put one out that I actually write. So uh, uh, this is one of them. I, the other one is a short one or two minute video that's a topic of, uh, that's in this general area. And then there's a sheet for notes. This is the first time I've done a webcast so I was trying to find the right word, and John's telling me I use the right word. Um, you know, because a lot of people can't come to something like this, you know, to drive across town, or, or maybe they're not even in town. So uh, this is an experiment, and I hope it goes well for those of you who are listening in. Okay, well, let's get back to in, in terms of what we're doing. My agenda is really, truly, to share information with you. I'm not selling anything here. And I understand and I recognize many of your purposes not only gather information to find out if I'm a real human being, because if you do choose to work with me, I'll talk about that later on. We'll take inf I'll take questions as we go along if you have questions, and certainly I'll be happy to take them at the end. Although, don't ask me a specific question about your mother-in-law, because I won't be able to get enough information from you to really understand what I need to say in response, but I'm happy to answer questions. So, before we get started, let me tell you about my uh, father-in-law, Ted. My father-in-law, Ted, truly was this man whose his approach to long-term care was, I'm going to shoot myself. I'm not going in any old home. And, and I told him, uh, don't do that. Uh, besides the fact, I'm not taking you into my home. He was a very grumpy man. And he had other family members who could step up. And he told me his backup plan was I was to shoot him which I told him wasn't going to work. I can't write a little piece of paper and put a gold seal on it, and that was keep me out of the state penitentiary. So I would 
try to call him every day and he wouldn't answer the phone. That would just make him mad. He lived about 10 blocks from me. And if I went to his house to just see how you're doing today, Dad, that would make him mad too. So I'd only go over on Saturdays. We'd have a whiskey, we'd chew the fat, and I'd come back the next Saturday. He fell down on a Tuesday, and the cleaning ladies, thank God, came on a Thursday. He was on the floor for two days. He ended up in intensive care for a month. And then he at, at St. Luke's, then he went across the street at the Elks. He was there for quite a few weeks. And then ended up in the Marquee, which is a, a long-term nursing care facility. And he was there about six months, and then ended up finally, thank God, back home. And that cost about $50,000 out of pocket. So I'm telling you, these are real issues. And if you say, I'm stubborn, I'm determined, I'm ne it's never going to happen to me, uh, I hope so. But that's just not statistically the way things go. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Before I get started, I want to know what you want to know about, what you're concerned about. So this is an interactive uh, morning. And what I'd like you to do is just take like two minutes and write down the top three things you're worried about, about aging. And then I'm going to have Terry write them down up here. And I'm going to make certain that I address your issues as well as other information this morning. So if you would just take a moment to write down just a few of the things that you're really truly concerned about, about aging. On a piece of paper, yeah. And then I'm going to ask you what they are, and we're going to write them down up here. Oh, you put your pencil down earlier, and now you just picked it up. So, <laughs> let, okay, so let me ask, let me see what yours are. Uh, Health care and assisted living. And can you expand on that a little bit? I'm trying to figure out how to get help when I can't help myself. You know, do I uh, try to re you know, register with a program now for when I need it? Do I wait till I need it? Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. Thank you for bringing that up. And protecting assets. Protecting them from what? Uh, not being, um, like if I die, that they're inherited in a way that's the most efficient and money not lost. Okay, and the right people I getting trust, it. I don't know what I need. Okay, okay. Making it easy when, when you're gone for whomever's easy, handling it. Sure it's not wasted. Okay. And you don't have somebody to do this. So that's, that's an important feature, and we're going to talk about that. So thank you for bringing that up. Did you have some additional things? Um, yes. Um, like on a, I want to make sure, like on a, if you make up a will, mm -hmm. you know, and you have like, um, with one spouse passes, the, everything goes to the other spouse. Um, is there a separate paper? I mean, if you have that in the will as your last wishes, is that still valid, or do you need to set up another uh, 
Okay. okay, we'll talk about that. The question is, how do you handle, is the will going to work, or do you need yeah. to do something else to make it work when you're gone? Yes. Okay, anything else on your list? Um, I have, I just wondered about an inheritance tax, like if you leave, have a house, you're leaving to a daughter, is there an inheritance tax? Cool, we'll talk about the taxes. You'll like my answer on that one. Okay, and so. then I don't know if this one is, a, but if you go to sell a house, like a capital gains, the capital gains, I don't know if you can. Okay, in terms of whether you have capital gains on the house sale, we'll yes. talk about that as well. Okay. That's great, thank you. Did you have something in addition? I most of mine. Well, that was easy. Martha, do you have something in addition? Thank you. Um, not being a burden to the family, all of whom live far away. Yeah, that's an issue. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that, Martha. Uh, 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 and how much medical, what does that mean? Well, you get to point. I keep wanting to send you out for more tests and this, that, and the other. And when do you say, hey, fuzz off? Yeah. And you want to know when that is to yeah, say that? How, yeah, how do you get around Cool. Over <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, uh, uh, my clients are all retired, or almost all of them are retired. And when I say, okay, uh, how about this day to come back and talk to me about something or sign some papers, they say, wait, I have to check my calendar because they've got all these doctor appointments. So it's just like, really? You've got that many to check? Okay. And then you talked about financial. That that's part of the medical one? The burden. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. What did you have, sir? Mine pretty much covered just where am I going to live, medical, who gets what. It's pretty simple stuff. That, and I'm not retired yet. But, so. Yeah, but still those are issues that we have to address. Okay. And did you have something in addition? No. <laughs> okay. I covered mine. What did you have? I have uh, will. I have will. But my family wants me to consider the trust and okay. the benefits of that. Long-term care of, of, and my daughter has married... Um, and I prefer the assets go to her, and if not to her, to my granddaughter, and how to make sure that happens. He's a wonderful man, but he has his own wealth, so. Uh, right, right. No, we'll talk about that. Absolutely. And you, sir, did you have something in addition? Mm, no, uh, I, I, I do have one question. I, uh, the, internal, the Internal Revenue of the Veterans Administration went to them and found out I wasn't destitute, and I'm not. I'm not entitled to any veterans. Yeah, I'll talk about the veterans' benefits. But if you're not destitute, evidently you don't get it. I got a letter to that. Yeah, yeah, the veterans' benefits are, are uh, wonderful, but they're hard to get. Because if you have a little bit of money, then they just say, sorry, you don't qualify. You're not interested in Right, unless you're 100% disabled, and thank God you're not 100% disabled. So, okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing that information with me. We will cover this. Uh, um, I'll make sure at the end, if I haven't talked about it, to take time to go through those things. I want to share with you just some basic information about planning, because otherwise it's like swatting at flies if I answer one thing and then it ties into something else. And then when we finish with that, I'll be sure we cover these. So what happens when you do estate planning, and, and that's all we do in my office, is I've been doing it so long, there's a real pattern to it. So there's three basic steps. And the first step is assess your current situation and figure out where you want to go. I sent one of my employees off to get me these pillars. They went to a wedding store. <laughs> what kind of a cake? I'm assuming this is a cake, some kind of giant cake. But anyway, so this is the first one. Assess your current situation, figure out where you want to go. And then the next one is come up with some plan to get you from where you are to where you want to go. And then the third one is just don't talk about it, actually implement that plan. Do it, you know, sign some papers, coordinate your assets, keep it up to date. So let's talk about the first one. This is homework for those of you uh, that are just trying to get started or even if you've done it before, have an estate plan in place, you still may want to do this. And I suggest you go to the kitchen table this evening or certainly this weekend. Don't put it off and say, I'll do it on July 4th because you won't remember what we're talking about then. And so the homework is take a piece of paper and write down who do you like. Who do you like? Who is going to inherit from you? Is it going to be your family? Is it going to be charities? Uh, you know, is it, I have a lady who has lots of dogs. It's all going for the benefit of her dogs. You know, what, who do you care about? Who's going to inherit from you? 
you may need a separate piece of paper or put it on the same piece of paper. Who's going to step up and handle things when you can't do it? Who's going to pay your bills? You're too sick to pay your bills? Who do you trust to do that? And who's going to wind things up when you're gone? It could be somebody different. If you don't have anybody to be in that slot, that's useful information because there are people in this community you can hire to do that. And then also, who's going to talk to you and help you out if you are seriously ill? Who's going to speak on your behalf to the doctor? That could be the same person you're using for the financial decisions, and it could be somebody different. And again, if you don't have anybody to fill that slot, that's useful information. There are people in this community who do that for a business. And I have some clients who use them, so they take them. If they're in the emergency room, they show up as soon as they know. They're the ones who communicate to the doctor. They go to the doctor visits with you. If you can't communicate effectively, you know, they, they'll speak up on your behalf because they know about you because you've spent the time visiting with them about your needs. The next piece of paper you pull out is a clean sheet, and that's going to be a balance sheet. So what you're going to do is list on that what you own and the approximate value. I don't care about the exact value. So you put down your house. Now, we all just got the assessment statement from the county, and you're probably all in shock, as I was, in terms of, uh-oh, it went up a lot in value. But I don't care. If you don't have another value, put down the assessment value. And if you own something up in Cascade, put down that, you know, the cabin or the rental that you have there. If you own something over in Ontario, Oregon, put down what that is worth. It's a rental or a home or a farm or whatever. And then you put down what are your car's worth, what do you normally keep in your bank. If you have mutual funds or brokerage accounts, what are they, what are the approximate values. Your retirement accounts, what are your IRAs, your 401ks, your deferred comp, what are they worth. If you have annuities, write down what the balance in the, is in that annuity. Do you have life insurance? If you have life insurance and there's a savings account built up in it, a cash value, write down that and write down the death benefit of the life insurance. If you have people that you really expect to inherit from, write down what you anticipate you might inherit from them. And then write down that number. In addition, if you have significant debts, a mortgage, large charge card balance, a loan on your car, write those things down. Then set that piece of paper aside. And the last thing is get up out of your chair and go find your documents. So go find your will, your power of attorney, your health documents. Go look at the deed to your house. Go look at the car insurance that you've got, or I mean the car title. Whose name is on the car title? If there's anybody other than you or you and your spouse, you want to get that name off of the car title. Because if you have a car wreck, they're getting sued because they're titled as an owner. And if you're on one of your kids' cars, you get your name off of that car title. Because if they have a wreck, you're getting sued. And good chance you may have more money than they do. So that's your current situation. The next thing about this first pillar of estate planning is you have to decide what are you going to do for the rest of your life. Now, I once went and spent three years going to a program in Chicago where I'd f to, to, to in improve my business. And the first bit of homework was I had to set my goals for one, three, five, and ten years. I would have paid somebody some money to do that for me. That was hard to make those personal commitments and say, this is what I want. But that's what I'm talking about. So you need to set your goals. What do you want to do for the rest of your life? You want to stay in your own home? Almost everybody says they want to stay in their own home. The problem is, is that going to work? I have an old home. It was built in 1906. It has a lion claw bathtub, which I have to climb into every day to take a shower. And I keep looking at that saying, I really love this bathtub, but this is stupid. Someday I need to get this out of here because I'm not going to be able to do this when I'm 85 and 90 years old and maybe before that quite a bit. So you need to look at your house. If you're going to stay in your house, what do you need to do to make it work? for the rest of your life. You know, you need to change the, lower the uh, counter in the kitchen, you need to change the lighting, put in grab bars in the bathroom, do whatever it is that it takes. The other thing is, maybe you're going to say, no, I'm going to move to Maryland to be closer to my daughter and my grandkids. Cool. Well, then when are you going to get that done? Because I have lived in my home for almost 40 years. I have more stuff than I should have. I find things and say, where did this ever come from? I don't know who gave it to me. I don't know if I ever bought it. I don't even know why I have it. 
And the problem is, if you're going to move, that's a, that's a big issue. How are you going to dispose of all that? Do you want to move into a retirement home like Meadow Lake or the terraces? You know, those are decisions you want to need to make. Also, if you want to go on a cruise once a year, you want to pay for your grandchildren's education, those are the kinds of things you need to address. So that's what I'm talking about, goal planning. So once you've accomplished that part, then the next thing is come up with a plan. Come up with something. Here you are, and this is what you want for the rest of your life while you're doing fine, and if you should decline, and then the day you're gone. Who's going to get your property, and who's going to handle things for you? Well, the most common plan is this one, which I just love. This was a cartoon in The New Yorker. The life-changing magic of shoving everything into a huge hefty bag and leaving it for someone else to deal with. Cool. Might make it easy for you, but feel sorry for the poor souls who come in behind you who have to figure out what is it you own and where it's all supposed to go. So this is, this is the most common estate plan. Most people don't have an estate plan. So what does that really mean if that's the plan you have in place? which is a non-plan, but the state has one for you. And what the state says, if you're a single person and you have no plan in place and you drop over dead one day, what will happen is if you have children, your property will go equally to your children. And if one of the children has died and they've got kids, that deceased child share will go down to the grandkids. And by the way, anybody who is 18 or older is considered an adult, so they get the money right away. And if they're under 18, who knows who's going to manage the money for the little people. If you have no children, it goes up to your parents. And then if your parents are gone, it goes out to your brothers and sisters and nieces and nephews. And if you don't have them, it would go up to the grandparents. And if you really don't have anybody, it goes to the State of Idaho Department of Education. And if you want to give it to the State of Idaho Department of Education, and they can certainly use the money, just say so in a will rather than doing it this indirect way. The other issue, oh, and if you're a married couple and you have no plan in place, what happens is there's two kinds of property owned by married people. There's community property and separate property. And the presumption is it's all community property, which means it all belongs to the two of you. It doesn't matter whose name is on the title. And then there's separate property. Separate property is what you inherited before the marriage, or I mean you owned before the marriage, or you inherited during the marriage, or you received as a gift during the marriage. And when you die, you can give away what you own. So if you're married and you have separate property, you can give away your separate property, and you can give one half of the community property away. So if you have no will in place, and it's all community property, what the law says, it goes to your spouse. And if you have separate property, then some separate property goes to your spouse, some separate property goes to your kids or your parents. So, cool, you're married and all goes to your spouse. It's all community property. Well, what that really means, though, is if you own a home, we have to probate the estate of the first spouse to die. What the law says in Idaho is when somebody is dead, who can sign on behalf of the dead person? And what the law in Idaho says is if the dead person owns real property, a house, a lot, a condo, or if that person has a cumulative value of titled assets in excess of $100,000, we have to probate their estate. So if you've got an, a brokerage account that's just in the name of the dead spouse or a single person that's over 100000 we have to probate the estate. So let me just talk about a married couple for a moment. A married couple, all they've got is some CDs and a brokerage account, both names in a bank, and the cars and both names. Everything's in both names, including the house. Everybody buys a house, husband and wife, or wife and husband. So the husband dies, and the wife wants to sell the house. It's too big, and she doesn't want to probate it. Well, how can she sign on behalf of the dead spouse to sell the house? You can't just wave around the Idaho Code section that says it all goes to the surviving spouse and your marriage certificate and the death certificate and your driver's license that shows who you are. And you can't forge your spouse's signature. I, I, when I was first married, I got married in the late 60s. And my husband was in the Marine Corps going off to the Vietnam War. And I was married about three months before he left for Vietnam for a year. And I learned how to forge his signature in about two weeks. And most married couples can figure out how to 
sort of forge their spouse's signature. Well, that does not work when the spouse is dead. The notary is not going to notarize a signature, a false signature for a dead person. So you will have to, even as a married couple, you will have to probate the estate, which means you have to file some papers with the court to say, hey, judge, appoint me to handle things, to be able to sign on behalf of the dead person. That individual is called a personal representative in Idaho. They're called executor or administrators other places. So if you're single, same thing. We got a dead person's name on a titled asset. So it will have to be probated, even though it eventually go equally to the kids if that's what you want. If you own property over in Ontario, Oregon, you will also have to probate the estate in Oregon. Every one of the 50 states controls the land within their boundaries. Yes? Forgive me, but what does, when you say it has to be probated, what does probated mean? What probated means, and thank you for asking that question. The question is, what does probated mean when I say what's probate? It means we have a dead person and their name is on titled assets and we have to figure out who has the power to be able to sign on behalf of the dead person. And that's called a personal representative here in Idaho. And once they're appointed by the court, they then are supposed to gather up the assets, protect the assets, pay the bills, and ultimately distribute everything out the way it's supposed to go. So in order to get to be appointed as personal representative, you have to file a petition with the local court to say, hey, judge, somebody is dead. I'm willing to take the job to handle their affairs. Please appoint me. And you have to send notice out to other people. There's an uh, there's a process depending on who it is that's died and what the relationship is of the person so who's it's probated. It's that process right. It's to get somebody the authority to sign. Correct. It's the court process that somebody is willing to step up and start the, the whole process to be appointed and then to do all the work and then ultimately get approval from the court that they've done it right and distributed out. Yes. Could you address the cost of that probate process or the probate tax percentage of whatever assets? Uh, yeah, the, the question is what's the cost and what's the tax? There, uh, the cost varies all over the place. Um, and nationwide, the, uh, the, there are statistics that show it's 4.5% of the gross value of the estate is the cost to pay for the attorney and the personal representative and some of the other expenses. Um, you're, Generally, you know, if it's all going to the surviving spouse, you might be looking at 2000 to to have that probate done. Idaho doesn't have any statutory forms or statutory uh, fees, places like Florida. You just look up and you say, oh, it's worth this amount of money. This is what the lawyer and the personal representative get paid. The taxes. Let me address the taxes because that's something we all hate, although our government definitely needs the money. Uh, and so there are three kinds of taxes when someone dies. There's income tax, death tax, and capital gains tax. So when I'm talking about a death tax, our government just changed the law in December. So if you're a married couple and you both drop over dead, it's $22 million or less. Okay, so if you have less than $22 million, there's no federal death tax. The federal death tax is called an estate tax. The Idaho death tax is called an inheritance tax. And Idaho uses the exact same number as the federal government. If you're a single person and you drop over dead, your death tax free estate from Idaho and the federal government is $11 million and less. So if you have less than $11 million, you don't pay any death tax. I don't know anybody who has $11 million. You know, so it's pretty much nobody's paying the death tax. In 2026, the law is supposed to drop back, so if you're a married couple, you only get $11 million that's death tax free. And if you're a single person, it's going to be $5.5 million. Again, nobody has this kind of money, so most people don't anyway. If those are issues for you, uh, you know, there are ways you can address those, but I'm not going to spend time talking about how do you try to avoid the death tax because it imp impacts less than 1% of the people in this country. There's another tax when someone dies. If you have an IRA and, you know, you've got this IRA and once you pass 70 and a half, you have to take minimum distributions and, and then you pay income tax on it because when you put the money in, the IRA, the 401k, you never pay tax on it. 
So that's cool. So when you die, whoever gets your IRA, they too are going to have to pay tax on it when they take it out, because the income tax was never paid. There's a third tax called the capital gains tax. And the capital gains tax is if you buy a stock for $10 a share and you sell it for $100 a share, that's a $90 gain. And the government says, we are so thrilled that you are that smart, that you made $90 on that investment. We want to tax that. So there's a state capital gains tax and a federal capital gains tax. And that's about 20 25%. The good news about dying, I sound like a mortician that's going to make a joke, but still, there's some pluses to the people behind you when you die. If you bought a stock for $10 a share and it's worth $100 a share and you sold it the day before you die, you're going to pay a capital gains tax on that. But if you die and you haven't sold it and it's worth $100 and it's inherited by your family, that's the new basis for capital gains purposes, not the $10, it's the $100. So if they sell it for $100, they pay no capital gains tax. If whoever inherits it sells it for $102, they pay tax, tax on $2. Who cares? It's nothing. That makes a big difference for people with rentals or, or large investments that the, you know, they, they inherited from their grandparents. They just let it sit in the brokerage account. Yes? For the IRAs, or the stocks that one may own, if they have direct beneficiaries, does that avoid any of this tax? The, the, the question is if you have an, an asset with a beneficiary, such as an IRA or life insurance or something like that, does it avoid the tax? Has nothing to do with the tax. All that uh, having a beneficiary designation does is there are different ways people inherit property. You, you say in your will, who's going to get whatever it is. You have a trust that says who's going to get whatever it is. You have a beneficiary designation on an asset. So a life insurance policy doesn't end up in the court system. If the life insurance policy says my next door neighbor gets my life insurance benefit, all I'll have to do is show a death certificate to the life insurance company, and they'll write a check out to the next door neighbor. If you don't have a beneficiary designation on an asset, it will go to your estate. Um, you know, so there are ways you can use beneficiary designations to help avoid the death probate. And you just helped me not have to talk about that later, because that was something else I was going to address later. So let me talk about what happens if you have no plan in place. You take this uh, hefty garbage uh, uh, bag approach, and forget about dying, but you have a stroke. You have a stroke or you have a car wreck, and I drop my purse. Okay? And I can't pick it up. I can't pick it up because I'm a mess. I'm in the hospital and I'm going to be in the hospital for quite a while. Who's going to pick up my purse? Who's going to help pay my bills and handle things for me until I can get back on my feet? What will happen if there's no plan in place is, first of all, somebody will step up and say they want to help me, whether it's my spouse or a friend or whomever. So it's my spouse of 50 years says, yeah, we need to sell this house. Susan's never being going to be able to come back to that house. And he wants to sign my name on the deed to sell the house. He can't do that. He can't forge my signature. I'm not there at the house closing. The title company is not going to let that work. So he'll have to say, OK, and he'll have to petition the court and ask for the power to be able to sign on my behalf, me, the incapacitated person. When he petitions the court, he's going to say he wants to be appointed my conservator. That's the one who handles my money. He's also going to ask at the same time to be appointed as my guardian, the one to handle the health and housing decisions for me. So he'll have an attorney. The law requires, even though we've been married 50 years, for another attorney to be appointed to represent me. And he can't choose who that attorney is. The judge is going to pull that name out of a hat. In addition, the law requires that a visitor be appointed. That's a person who goes and talks to everybody and makes a recommendation to the court about what's appropriate. And that usually is a third attorney. Sometimes it's a master's in social work, but it's another professional. Then a doctor has to evaluate me to say Susan's a mess. And yes, she needs somebody to handle her affairs. You take those four professionals in this county these days, it costs five to $10,000 if people aren't fighting about it too much. You just get four professionals, that's an easy $5,000. It takes normally, at fastest, about three months to get appointed. 
And then once somebody's appointed, they have to file, so the conservator, my husband, has to file an accounting at least once a year with the court showing what he's doing with the money. And if he fails to do that, he will be fired and an independent person will be hired to handle the finances. He will also have to have a background check with the FBI to see that he's not a crook and everybody else who lives in the house will have to go through the same thing. He will have to take a test to show that he knows what he's doing. This is onerous. And the law is designed that way to make it hard for people to steal from incapacitated people. Because there are all kinds of studies that show zillions of dollars are being s stolen from people who are incapacitated. In my personal opinion, it's made it much harder for the good people to get the job done, to be able to step up and help. And if you're going to be a crook, you'll just figure out some other way around it. So it'll take five people to pick up my purse. It'll take about three months. So that's the no plan. So let's start coming up with an improvement, OK? One of the things you can do is, just as, as mentioned, you can make beneficiary designations on certain assets. You can say the beneficiary of my life insurance, my IRA, you know, my bank account is a paid on death account. You know, so you can do that, and that would avoid having to go to court for a probate. We're talking about when you're dead. Then one, because you just show a death certificate, and then it, it you know, goes to whomever is named on that particular account. You could also sign a will. A will would be really useful. A last will and testament, and we're all safe here. To sign a will, you have to, ha you have to be over age 18. That's why I say we're all safe in this room. You also have to be competent. That's a very low standard. You have to know who you are. You have to know, you don't even have to know you're sitting here in Boise, Idaho. Uh, you have to know who your immediate family is. You have to know what kind of assets you have and the approximate value. So that's not real high standard. But basically what you say in a will is you say who's going to be in charge. And we always name a backup. So you say my personal representative is going to be my spouse or my child or a, a friend or a relative. Or you pick a professional. You say I want a bank trust department to handle that. And if you name a human, we want an alternate. So that if the first person isn't available, we've got somebody else to step up. Because you don't want to have to go back and amend these papers if something happens to someone. They die, or they get too ill, or they just can't, it's too, they're too overwhelmed to pick up that job. Then you say, yes? Is it wise or unwise to name three children as equal personal representatives? So you want all, th you want all three kids to work together? <laughs> Is yeah, it you wise or unwise? <laughs> I, I, I'm not a fan of, it. Well, the question is, can you name three kids or three anybody to work together as the personal representative? You can. I'm not a huge fan of that. Part of the reason, unless they're all in the same town, that's a problem. And then I, I, it, what happens under the law is if, if two of them don't agree, I mean, one doesn't agree, the other two can outvote the first one. Yeah, um, you can do that. It takes three signatures to deal with everything. It's just cumbersome. Um, but certainly you can. Um, and normally, you name somebody first, and then you name some alternates. And you can go long, long your list of al alternates. Usually, three is the maximum I go, because you know, we have to start slaughtering people to end up running out of humans to do that. Then you refer to a list in your will of who gets the stuff, who gets the ring, who gets the painting, who gets the rug, who gets the gun. And then you talk about specific distributions. I give $10,000 to Boise State. I, I you know. Um, I give $5,000 to the Idaho Humane Society. You can put in information about how you want any pets cared for. I'm a dog lady. I've had dogs forever. Um, and so you know, I've provided in my estate plan who gets my dog and how much money they get, because the vet bills are always breathtaking. And then you say everything else goes to whomever. You know, goes to my spouse, goes to my kids, my grandkids. If you have young people who are inheriting from you, I strongly encourage you to put in a clause that says the money's managed for them until they're 30. There are studies that show young people are idiots at the, until their late 20s. My office is on Fort Street. It's two blocks from uh, the YMCA. And I walk through the um, Boise High campus to go to the Y to exercise a couple of times a week. And I've turned into my grandmother. I have for years. I mean, I walk across that campus in the morning when they're on their break, and they're just the clothing they wear, you know, the purple and green hair. Some of those people are 18. And if you hand the money, 
they competitively spend it. They just don't understand how hard it is to earn money and have enough set aside so you've got some savings. So normally you say, no, the money's managed until they're 30, and you choose who manages for them. They can use it to go to school, a down payment on a house, whatever you think is appropriate. And then when you write a will, you also say, if anybody you gave property to predeceases you, what do we do with it? So if you give it equally to your three kids, and one of your kids dies first, does it just go to the surviving two? Or does that share for the deceased child go down to the grandchildren? I mean, those are decisions you have to decide. So now you have a will and you drop over dead. What's different? Nothing. You're still going to have to probate the estate. If my mother wrote a will that says everything goes to me and I'm the personal representative and my mother dies and I say this probate thing is bunk. I'm getting it all. I'm in charge. Why would I probate the estate? And I go down to the real estate closing to sell the house. I show the will. I show my birth certificate. I show my mother's death certificate. I show my driver's license and passport. And I say I'm signing. Don't tell me about getting any court order. They'll say go away Susan. We don't know you have the power to do this. You need an order from the court that says you are the one who is the personal representative who can sign on behalf of the dead lady. So when you have a will, that's useful, because at least it goes the way you want it to be, rather than looking in the Idaho Code. But it doesn't mean you avoid the probate. And if I have a will and I drop over, I, I, I have a, an accident and I can't handle things, I drop my purse, I'm still having to go through the conservatorship and guardianship proceeding. Because the will only deals with death. It doesn't deal with being incapacitated. So what are some other documents you can sign? I have them in the packet that I gave you, and we sent that out to people who are listening in on, on, the, on the webinar. And, and these are the health power of attorney and living will and the financial power of attorney. These are critical to have. These are the Idaho Code's standards, and we've added some extra language to make them more powerful. And there are instructions in here on how to fill them out. So the health power of attorney, you would say, who's going to talk to the doctor when you can't communicate effectively, and who's an alternate? And the same thing on the financial power of attorney. Who can sign your checks, and who's an alternate if you can't, you need somebody to pay your bills? The problem with these financial powers of attorney, <coughs> excuse me, is <coughs> under the law, which was adopted in 2008, it says the banks and everybody have to take those things. And if they don't take them, they have to tell you within seven days in writing why they won't take the power of attorney. So what's happened is shortly after the, the law was passed, one of the banks refused to take them. <coughs> it was Key Bank. And, and uh, I get a journal as an attorney. And so uh, it was, I was notified of, by that of a Twin Falls attorney in the journal. And then about two months later, the, the, the president of the Key Bank took a full page ad and said, we love these powers of attorney. What I'm telling you is I can't tell you that they'll always be accepted. So you can't rely 100% on the powers of attorney being available if your spouse signed that power of attorney saying you have the power to sign to sell the house and do other things that it's actually going to work. It should, but you know, what are you going to do? If they say, no, I'm not taking it, you're going to sue that financial institution? No, because you don't know where that lawsuit's going to go. So you're going to end up going through a conservatorship and guardianship proceeding. For married couples, you can also um, assign a document to avoid the first probate that's called a community property agreement or a devolution agreement. It's a short contract that says we don't care who dies first, the other gets it all. And by the way, the legal description of our house is Lot 2, Block 10 of the Franklin subdivision. That gets recorded in the county where that property is located. And so if you own something in Ada County, you'd record one here. If you own some up in uh, Valley County, you'd record another one up in Valley County to cover that property. Then when somebody dies, you don't have to probate it. All you do is file a certified copy of the death certificate with an affidavit, said my spouse is dead, give me them, put the house in my name. So that's easy. So those are some of the plans. Now let me talk about some other ones. <coughs> One of them is a revocable trust. All these little boxes up here are different trusts. Uh, I'm a lawyer all day, every day, and then I go home and I do glitter. You know, I just can't, I, I love being a lawyer, but I have to do something else other than wander around in my brain. So these are my little boxes. And a revocable trust, so you can open it up, and at this point it's empty. And what it says in there, if I'm a single person, it says, it's like I'm setting up a little business. I'm going to manage my affairs for the rest of my life. And if I'm too ill to do it, then I want Terry to step up and do that for me. And she's supposed to pay the bills for me and keep my life going in a pleasant way. 
And then when I drop, and if I get better, I take over again. In addition, when I drop over dead, I want Terry to be the one to handle things, to pay my bills and ultimately distribute things out. So that's what it says in here. As a married couple, it's very similar. For most married people, you say, it's the two of us manage it. And then if one gets sick, the healthy one manages it without a court proceeding. And then when the one dies, the survivor gets it all. If the survivor gets sick, we don't have to go to court for conservatorship and guardianship. And then when the survivor dies, somebody steps in, pays the bills, and distributes it out. The money manager is you, the trustee. And then, but you have other people behind you, the alternate trustees, when you're too ill or when you resign or when you drop over dead, similar to a personal representative. Well, this is just empty. empty. So how do you really make it work? <coughs> what you do is you put your assets in the name of the trust. Remember, I said we're going to court because we have a dead person or a sick person's name on a titled asset. Who can sign on their behalf? So now if we put the titles in the name of the trust, then the trustee the money manager can sign on behalf of it. So I put the new deed to my house. I take it out of my name, Susan Graham, put it in Susan Graham, trustee of the Susan Graham Trust. I have a family farm that my grandparents had and up in Camas County. So I do the same thing and record a deed up in Camas County. The Oregon property, I'd have an Oregon attorney do a deed to put that in the name of the trust. I'm not licensed in Oregon, so I can't do that deed. I take my brokerage account, change it out of my name, put it in my name, Susan Graham, trustee of the Susan Graham Trust. They say, what's the tax ID number? It's my social security number. Or if I'm married, it's my spouse's social security number. So there's nothing special about that. The taxes stay all the same. I take the beneficiary designation of my life insurance, make it my trust. My IRA would be my trust or my spouse first and then the trust. So I've got all my assets lined up with there. My bank account, I make it a paid on death account, POD account. When I'm dead, it goes into the trust. In the meantime, my checks are exactly the same as they were before. So now I've got all this stuff in the trust. And I, and I, you know, I don't like that brokerage account anymore. So I take it out and I sign trustee on the paperwork and put it in a new brokerage account, put it in here. So it's easy to change the stuff. And I can change any time I want who's in charge and who's the, who gets the money. So I've got a trust now, and now I drop over dead. What happens? <clears throat> this is different. All that happens is if I name Terry as my trustee, she's going to get a certified copy of my death certificate. She's going to sign a paper that says she'll take the job as trustee. She files that at the courthouse. She's instantly in charge. What she does is then gathers up the assets. She shows those papers. She gathers up the assets, pays my bills, and then shows an accounting to everybody to show what she started with, what came in, what went out, what's left over, who gets what share. She gets everybody to say, yeah, I think that's cool. I, I agree. That's what I'm entitled to. And then she starts writing checks and distributes it out to it. So that's the way a trust works. And she won't, by the way, have to probate it in Ontario because it's not... The, the, there's Ontario property, but the owner is the trust, not me as a human. So she doesn't have to probate it. She just signs as trustee of the trust, sells that property or transfers where it's supposed to go. And if, God forbid, I'm going down the road and I have a car wreck again or I have a stroke, how many people does it take to pick this up? How long and how much money does it take? What we do is, in the documents we draft, we say, if a doctor says I'm incompetent, then I am. You know, if I can resign, I can resign, but I, I'm a mess, so I can't resign. So she gets a statement from the doctor. That usually takes five to 10 days that says I'm a mess. Terry says, I agree, I'll take the job. She files that at the court. She's instantly in charge. So we don't have those three lawyers. We don't even have the judge involved. We do have the doctor. We need the statement from the doctor that says I'm a mess. And, I, and we want that. We don't want Terry to just make an announcement one day, Susan's a mess, and then she, behind my back, goes and takes all my money and leaves town. So, you know, we want some protections in there. And then again, if I get better, I can take over. So that's one of the reasons people like the trust. Another reason is if you have, if you have a colorful life, you may want to trust. <clears throat> I had one man who... Uh, was dying of cancer for quite a while, and about a week before he died, he decided he'd finally do an estate plan. I did not do this plan. He talked to me, but he went instead to his favorite drinking buddy, which is fine, and I'm certain it's close to one of the world's worst wills I've ever seen. He did do a will, 
And I, I'm convinced they split a fifth of their favorite beverage between the two of them when they, by the time they got this thing done, because it was pretty bad. He, had, he named his two other favorite drinking buddies to handle his affairs, to be the personal representative. And if they weren't able, then he named his daughter, who happened to work for me. Then he said, I give to my wife, who's demented, and my mother, who's demented, certain property. And I give to my children, who are uh, from separate marriages, different property, some of which they were to share. And I give my mistress of 30 years, my junior, uh, quite a bit of property as well. And then he died. Well, everybody hated everybody. And the two drinking buddies were in cahoots with the mistress. So there was a lot of money disappearing from this estate. He had two liquor licenses. He had a bar um, that was quite colorful, and, and it was in a small town in Idaho. He had a still in his basement, a stainless steel still that was gigantic, that I'm sure he was making booze that he was selling in his bar. He had a, a, a machine gun collection. He had a Luger collection. He had mining claims. I mean, this was just well, was quite out there. And what happened is, we had to litigate all this stuff. So we finally got the two drinking buddies thrown out and the daughter appointed as personal representative. And we couldn't do anything because everybody thought about it. So we always had to ask the judge for permission for the next step. We would show up in this tiny town about once a month. And we were better than the local community play. People would pack the courthouse to see what's going on now with this colorful family. They were horrified. They were just horrified. And so, you know, and if he instead had had a trust that said, I give so much to my mistress and all these other people, and if he said, if anybody fights about it, they don't get a dime, nobody would have known about all this stuff instead of the whole town knowing about this messy history of this particular family. So that's another advantage. If you have a really colorful life, you might want to think about that kind of trust. One of you asked about <coughs> If I give the money uh, to my daughter and, then, and she's married to someone and then she, if she dies, what's going to happen is you give 300000 to the daughter, she dies, probably the husband's going to end up with it, not the grandchildren, and then the husband remarries and then he dies and then the new wife, wife number two, ends up with the money, not your children, not your grandchildren. So sometimes people like to use these kinds of trusts. They're called inheritance trusts, and what that says is 300,000 goes in here. And the daughter can manage it and do what she likes. It's also asset protected. That means if she has a lawsuit, she gets hit by somebody, you know, and it hits somebody because the sun's in her eyes. It gets sued for a zillion dollars, and they know there's 300,000 in here to help pay. She can say, go away. They can't take it. So it's protected from creditors, lawsuits, bankruptcy, divorces. And then when she dies, it goes to the grandkids. Well, what's the point of having an inheritance if you can't spend it? I mean, if you, if you don't give it to those people, can you spend it? Well, we lawyers are really clever. So yes, yeah, she can spend it. We have a trap door in the bottom. She can take the money out whenever she wants to. But when somebody's knocking on the door saying, you owe me all this money, or I'm getting divorced from you, I want some of this money, they cannot take it. So that's something a lot of people like to do as an estate plan. And then, of course, we have people who are on disability, or we have, uh, I have clients whose children literally live under the Broadway Bridge. You know, they just can't get it together. They're mentally ill. They have drug or alcohol problems. We can put money in other kinds of trusts to protect that inheritance for them. Now, so those are some planning techniques, but let me now talk about the long-term care issue, the long-term care piece, because that's the scariest part. You know, you're dead, you're dead. It's going to get distributed. Somebody's going to be able to handle it, whether you make it easier for them or not. But what happens if you become seriously ill and you need to pay for care in your home, assisted living, or nursing homes? The way you're going to pay for that is you're going to pay for it out of pocket until you run out of money, or maybe not run out of money. You're going to pay for it with long-term care insurance, or you're going to pay for it with one of the three government programs. The three government programs are Medicare, okay? Anybody over 65, you're on Medicare. Medicare is a federal uh, program that, it's basically a health insurance program, but there's a piece of long-term residential care in there. And what, the way you access that is if you fall down, you have a stroke or something, and you end up in the hospital for three or more days, you're admitted to the hospital, and then you get discharged to the Elks, and you're there for rehab, they'll pay 100% for the first 20 days. 
And then if you still need care, then you're going to end up in another, maybe another place, or maybe stay at the Elks. And for another maximum, more 80 days, so a total of 100 days, Medicare will pay part, and you or your supplemental insurance will pay part of the next 80 days. Our government, uh, I mean, I was in the news this morning. They said, oh, for the first time since 1982 or something like that, there's more money going out under the Social Security program than there's money coming in. And Medicare is part of that. Because you paid into this program. You had these withholdings from your wages for a long time. And, and it's insurance you purchased. So our government doesn't have any money. In my opinion, they don't seem to be addressing that as, as a, a serious issue. And what happens now is that uh, what they just said on the Social Security is that we don't have enough money to cover our bills. Of course, they can borrow from Peter to pay Paul. It's the federal government. And what they've done is they've cut your access to these benefits, and they haven't done it publicly. What they say is, no, you weren't admitted to the hospital for the three or more days. You were there for observation. And if you were there for observation, Medicare won't pay for it. And the bills for those first 20 days that I and my attorney friends have seen range between six and $45,000 that now come out of your pocket, which is wrong. And there's a bill in Congress that says, admitted observation, what difference does it make? You know, it should be the same, because you're getting, pardon me, exactly the same, same treatment. It's the hot potato. Who's going to pay the bill? So everybody's trying to pretend, not me. The bill that's in front of Congress, they've just kicked it in a corner. There's no effort that I'm hearing about to get that actually passed. So if you or someone you care about ends up falling down or for whatever reason ends up in the hospital, you want to make sure that they're there not only for the three days and they don't push them out after two, unless that's actually the way it should be working, and you want to be sure they're admitted. If they're not admitted and they're there for observation, they won't be covered under Medicare. Uh, how do you get it changed from uh, admit, uh, observation to admitted? I, I, I have no idea. I mean, I have an idea, but I'm, that's not my expertise. First of all, if that happens to you, call us. We have some people we, we can refer you to to do that. We also have a handout o over on the table that Terry has. She'd be happy to give it to you. It's put out by the Center for Medicare Ad Advocacy, and they talk about some techniques to try to get that switched. This is a, uh, this is a financial decision. And people can tell you with a straight face why you're, why you're only there for observation, but I, I don't care. I mean, you pay this insurance, and it should be available to you. But I want you to understand, that's one way long-term care, a portion of it, up to a maximum of 100 days gets paid, is under the Medicare program. Then there's the VA program. And you, sir, mentioned about the VA program. And the VA has a great program. It's called Aid and Attendance. And what, what it says, it's a non-service connected pension benefit, meaning you, didn't have to, you don't have to have a disability or something. You didn't have to get shot in wartime. It just means you were a veteran. And to qualify, you have to be over 65. You have to have served 90 days on active duty, one day during wartime. That doesn't mean somebody shot at you. You could be pushing them up in a basement, but one day during wartime. The wartimes... And you can't be dishonorably discharged. Okay, those are the criteria. Um, what the benefit is is they will help pay for caregivers in your home and in assisted living or nursing homes. But there's an asset test besides the ones I just mentioned. And the asset test is you can have a house. They don't really care what's worth, and a car, and the stuff in the house. They don't really care about that. But of your other assets, if they exceed a maximum of about $80,000, you won't qualify. Now, my clients are middle class people, and they have done all the right things, so they certainly tried. So they've shoved money into their retirement accounts, their IRAs, their 401ks, they got CDs, they've got a brokerage account. So they can't qualify because they've got more than $80,000. And let's say you have um, all you've got is a $100,000 IRA. You don't have a savings account. You just got a house and a hundred thousand IRA. You don't qualify because you've got too much money. So you say, okay, I'll give my IRA away and then I'll qualify. Well, if you pull out all the money from the IRA, you have to pay the tax on the whole thing. 
you know, so you're talking about a 35% tax, something like that. So instead of the 100,000, you end up with $65,000. Well, that's crazy. You know, that's not an, an appropriate business technique. Right now, under the VA rules, um, it says, uh, supposedly, you can give your assets away, but there's a bill pending in con and, and, and it doesn't matter. And then, so forget giving the IRA away, because if you give it away, again, you pay the tax. But let's say you had a $100,000 CD, you gave it away. Well, that's fine, and now you're down, down below the 80000 and so you'll qualify. But the problem is there's a law pending that says if you give your assets away, you have to wait three years before you can apply for the veterans' benefits. So this is a good benefit, and it pays a little over $1,000 a month for, for a, a widower or a widower of a veteran, and up to around $2,500 a month, but you can't get it. So even though there's a safety net out there, it's difficult to get. As a veteran, you have a priority for going into their facilities. And, and I have a number of men who are veterans who are in the veterans' facilities, uh, the skilled nursing, the assisted living, because there are a whole bunch of other veterans there. And they get to tell stories, and they, uh, you know, and, and they, uh, which is wonderful. Um, but it, you're privately paying. The third benefit is a government program is Medicaid which is a state and federal program. And the Medicaid program, again, uh, is very generous right now to uh, married people and not so much for single people. But you need to remember, we have this, we're an aging population. One of the reasons they have problems under the Social Security uh, system is when it was initially set up, they had five working people who were kicking in money into the system for every one retired person. And now it's like three working people for every retired person, and it's diminishing. But the Medicaid program at the moment is generous for married people. And I can't believe that it's going to continue that way because we have 10,000 people turning 65 every day. And in addition, those people are not at all prepared for retirement. It depends on whose numbers you look at. Some of the numbers say uh, less uh, th uh, that approximately 50% have less than $50,000. You can't. I mean, that's not going to cut it for you for the rest of your life when you look at the medical expenses that you have to pay that are not covered by your insurance and just normal living. Anyway, under the current Medicaid program, they'll help pay for care in very little care in your home it normally is for assisted living or nursing homes so your spouse is in the nursing home and you're paying eight thousand dollars a month and you the healthy spouse are having a panic attack how do you deal with that well the healthy spouse isn't you can have the state pay the bills for the ill spouse but the healthy spouse will end up with a house these rules are insane a house of an unlimited value you could have a five million dollar house one car of an unlimited value, you could have a Maserati, and then a stuff in the house they don't care. The IRAs, the retirement accounts, they ignore. But of the other assets, you have 300,000 in other assets and CDs. The healthy spouse can only keep about 120, and then that 180 has to poof, go away someplace. So you pay the bills at 8,000 a month, that's one way to make it go away. You can buy exempt assets, you could buy a more expensive home, you can't give it away. If you give it away, the law says you have to wait five years before you can apply for Medicaid, so that doesn't work. But you can buy exempt assets. So one of the exceptions is the healthy spouse, my Aunt Betty, Uncle Frank's in the nursing home, she could take that 180000 buy an annuity. It's a special annuity. Don't go to your regular annuity salesperson. Have that annuity paid back to her in equal monthly installments over a three-year period. So she gets 120000 She gets 180000 The moment, the day, excuse me, the month after she buys the annuity, Frank will qualify for Medicaid. And then the state and the federal government will pay his costs at $8,000, but they'll certainly take his Social Security and pension. So maybe he's got 1000 in that, so they'll pay $700 or 7000 for him. By the way, the state gets a, a break, so they don't pay quite the same rate we pay privately. But that's a technique that really works well for married couples. Medicaid is a loan program. They want to be paid back. The VA program, is a, it's, a, it's a distribution, so you never have to pay that back. So when Frank and Betty both die, 
somebody's going to be knocking on the family's door saying, we paid $100,000 under the federal and state program under Medicaid for Frank's benefit. Who's paying us back? So if Betty had a house when you know, Frank died and then Betty died a couple of years later, they certainly can force the house to be sold. They will only get paid the $100,000. they are not going to get the whole house. It's just whatever they paid out of pocket. It's very generous for married couples, which is great. It is not for single people. If you're a single person, you can qualify for Medicaid. You can have a house and a car and the stuff in the house, and then you have to be down less than $2,000. And how can you keep the house? Because your Social Security and pension are going to go toward paying for your care. The state will make up the difference. But you have no money to pay the taxes, the insurance, the maintenance on the house. So I, I'm just saying those are programs that are out there. One thing I really like, and I, I, it's just our government cannot pay for everybody's care. So relying on the government to do it is uh, not a plan I would recommend. And so long-term care insurance is certainly an option. I know a lot of you say, oh my God, that's so expensive, I'm too old. I know nothing about it, okay? I'm an attorney, I don't sell it. But we do, uh, there are people who handle those kinds of products. You might look at them. Terry has some information about uh, one of the people that we work, for, work with. By the way, I get no kickback. I do get chocolates at Christmas. I keep telling them I want apples, not chocolates. Every Christmas season, I put on another couple of pounds, and I never seem to be able to take them off. I'm tired of that. So anyway, but he doesn't get the hint. Nonetheless, they have all kinds of products, some tied to life insurance, sometimes to annuities, sometimes to straight insurance. I'm just suggesting you might want to look at it, because if you can get just a couple of years of long-term care covered, that's very helpful. Because one of the other asset techniques we have is an asset protection trust. I have clients who, uh, I had a client come to me in his 60s, and he said, everyone in my family, when they are 75, they are demented. He said, on both sides of my family, I'm concerned that that will be me, and I will need extensive long-term care, and I want to protect my assets. So what we did is we put a significant amount of his assets, his Ontario property, his Cascade property, some rainy day money he wasn't using, we put it in this irrevocable trust. Uh, and I have it locked up with two locks. Uh, basically, I try to wrap these things up with razor wire. Because if you give the, that property to a child or that cash to a child and you just say, hang on to it for me for, for at least five years, because if, if you give away money within five years, you can't qualify. So I'm trying to get through the five years. And if that child spends the money, how are you going to get back? If, if you call up the child and say, I need the money back because I can't get through the five years, they may say, I'm not giving it to you. I'll never get my inheritance. They get sued. Their creditors can take the money. So we don't give it to the child outright. We put it in these irrevocable trusts. But nonetheless, if you can get through the five-year period, then this money, and you need to qualify for Medicaid, this money can be available to pay extra money so you can have a private room or a massage once a week or flowers. It can pay for the grandkids to come visit you in the nursing home or it can pay for the grandkids' education. And then when you die, this goes wherever you've said and it doesn't go back to reimburse the state. So there are, I'm just saying there are some other techniques you can use, but you've got to certainly plan for that. Yes? The question is, what's the difference between a revocable and an irrevocable trust? This revocable trust, you can change the investments. You can change how you spend the money. You can change who's in charge. You can change who gets it for as long as you're alive and your brain cells are working. When, if, if this were my trust, and as a single person, I drop over dead, as soon as I'm dead, this is irrevocable. Whatever I've said, they have to do. They can't say, this is a dumb idea. We don't like it. They have to do what I've said. An irrevocable trust is after somebody dies, and it's got money in it, property in it. They can't change it. Sometimes you set up irrevocable trusts during your lifetime. And, and this, these inheritance trusts, often we set these up as an original estate plan. So we have a revocable trust for my property. And then this is an empty shoebox. I've got it, all the paperwork in place, but there's nothing in it. And when I die, it says, take the money from me here, or if I have a will, take my money from my will and drop it in this irrevocable trust. 
and that means somebody else can't change the terms. Okay, so we can't, you can't say that was a dumb idea. I will tell you though, on these trusts, we give the children so much power that they can actually take all the money out. We give them a lot of flexibility, but again, it's irrevocable, and we play, let's pretend it's my money. It never officially belongs to the child, so their creditors cannot take this money. This is another irrevocable trust that's set up. Again, normally these are funded after death. I had a couple who had a severely disabled child, and when they both died, they had all their money in a trust like this for that child. He could not speak, he, he was not mobile, he had a, an unbelievable space machine uh, um, wheelchair. I mean, he just was, uh, it was, he was a poor soul. Anyway, if he had inherited from mom and dad, he would have lost all of his disability benefits. Normally, if you have more than $2,000, you don't get the disability benefits. And the, you can't buy in the private market the level of care he was getting under the Medicaid program. So this money was there just to help out, to supplement. So if he wanted to go to Disneyland, they could have rented a plane and six people to take him, you know, and it cost a zillion dollars. It wouldn't matter. They, it's the, what the family would want for him. So irrevocable. You, and this one, you can set the money up during your lifetime, put it in an irre irrevocable trust. But if you treat it like your own piggy bank, they say it's a sham. So when we do this for asset protections for Medicaid, we stick assets in, and the one who created it is the person who is just trying to plan ahead. They can't be their own trustee. They can't manage the money, again, because it's a sham. You know, if, if, I manage, if I say, I'm putting 100000 in here, and let's just ignore it for Medicaid purposes, but I'm the one that can still, it's my 100000 and I can still take it out any old time I want, they're going to say, this is just a joke. This doesn't count. So you have to meet certain standards. But irrevocable means you can't change it. But it has to be drafted properly. You can't have this. You can have a back door because mom and dad drafted it. But you can't make a back door for yourself on these others. So those are some planning techniques. Now the rest is really simple for me to cover. And that is the third pillar. So you assessed your current situation and where you want to go. You came up with some plan to bridge that for you, one or more of a combination of these documents, and then you do it. Don't just talk about it. Do it. That means you sign the papers, you coordinate your assets or the beneficiary designations with the, with the documents. You talk to the people that you want to have be as agents, so it's not a surprise for them. When you're dead, you don't want somebody to say, oh, by the way, Susan was relying on you taking care of it. And, you know, they don't know that they're supposed to step up or protect the assets or do what you wanted them to do. They may not even want to do it. And then you need to keep it up to date. And the reason I say that is, again, I've been doing this a long, long time. I have clients in who came to me 20 years ago or more. I had one last week. It was 22 years. They said, oh, we thought we'd check in to see if anything's changed, Susan. I just started laughing. I try to be polite, but I mean, there's a limit. Uh, you know, the world has blown up in, in the last uh, 22 years. Uh, the law has changed. Certainly, they've aged. Their needs have changed. Their finances have changed. They, uh, they actually had a trust. They purchased some property that they forgot to put in the trust. Uh, they didn't like some of their kids anymore. You know, so uh, it, it's useful to keep it up to date because you only want these papers when everything goes wrong. When you get seriously ill, you have a stroke, you have a car accident, or you drop over dead. And nobody's told us when those days are going to happen, thank God, because we'd all wait a month before, and even then some of us would miss the mark about getting the plan done. I had a lady come to a program like that this years ago, and she came to see me, and, and we visited, and then she said, well, I'll think about it. And then she came back the next spring. She did that three springs running, never did do anything. And then uh, she called me up in July, and said, it was a Thursday, and she said, I'm in St. Luke's, I'm having some tests done, I'd like you to draft that will for me. And then I pulled out my notes, and we talked a little on the phone, and we figured out what it was she wanted, and I said, okay. And then she said, would you bring it over to the hospital tomorrow? I'm having some tests done, and I'd like to sign it. I don't normally, uh, please don't ever expect that I'm going to show up at the hospital for you within 24 hours. I mean, it's just really hard to have that kind of turnaround, but at that time I said I was able to get it done. I said, when do I come to the hospital? And she said, I don't know. As soon as the tests are done, I'll call you when that's over. Well, the, test, the call we got was she died. 
And she was a widow. She had no children. She was in her 80s. She had wanted to give it a third to her cousin, a third to a friend, and a third to her church. Her sisters had predeceased her, so she had no will. It didn't matter what I had and my information. We had to probate her estate. We had, she died in testate, which meant then we had to go to her parents, you know, and her parents obviously were long gone. She was in her 80s. We ended up going to her grandparents. It took, instead of the three people, it took, we ended up with 30 some people. I mean, we created the family tree that nobody had created before. Nothing went to her church. Nothing went to the friend. The cousin got a little bit. It took us over three years to find all these people because the law required we spent three years looking. And it, some of you might remember that millionaire program from the late 50s, early 60s, where somebody calls you up and says, you've got a million dollars. Well, her state wasn't quite that large, but we sent letters. Do you know how long it takes to write a letter to 30-some people, even if it's the same letter? put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it, keep track that you mailed it, keep track when they come back. We had people knocking on our door saying, I'd like some more money and I'd like it right now today, please. Um, you know, it took a long, long time. It was very expensive to do and it wasn't what she wanted. And the only reason I give you that as an example, and I've got tons of them, is don't keep waiting and saying, yeah, 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 I'll do it. I had a lady come to a program like this this spring and I met with them yesterday. And she said, oh, one of the reasons we're here is because I had a stroke last week. I was impressed that she was able to walk through my door, so it must have been a pretty mild stroke. But she says, I really think maybe we ought to get going on this. It's like, well, yeah, you don't really need to wait for a stroke before you do that. And if you're lucky that you can still walk after it. So all that I'm saying is actually do something. You can always change it later and then keep it up to date. Um, and it, because the law, your health, your money, and your relationship change. Something's bound to change as time goes by. And you only want it again for the bad days. So let me go through um, this last little bit of information, and I'm happy to take your questions. If you would be nice enough uh, if, to fill out this green form, I'd appreciate it. Um, f there are p multiple purposes to this. One of them is... There are studies that show if you would just write down what you learned and what action steps you want to take to improve your circumstances, you are 10 times more likely to actually get it done. As opposed to, you know, you do goal planning in the middle of the beginning of the year and you say, you know, I want to do, I want to buy a new car, I want to go get a, 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 take a class. I keep saying to myself, I want to take a geology class because I, I think Idaho is so fascinating you know what, I've never written that down. And it, I can tell you it hasn't happened, even though someday maybe I'll get to do that. Um, but if you would like to um, meet with me, you can indicate that. The way that works is you'll get a call from one of my uh, people, and they'll ask you a few questions to see if we could possibly be a good fit. Sometimes people say they want to meet with me, and it's not what I do. You know, so we'll send you off to, we'll refer you to somebody who we think can do a better job for you. Or, or if it, we are a good fit, then we'll set up an appointment. There's no charge for that first meeting. And at that meeting, we go through this whole process we've just described. And uh, we determine, again, at the end of that meeting, we come up with a budget, what it's going to cost, and, and if we're a good fit or not. People ask me about my fees. I can't tell you what my fees are without specifically talking about your circumstances. They generally range between 3000 on the low side to 15000 on the high side. If it's $15,000, i am doing multiple things for you. And, I, but, and the only reason anybody ever wants to pay me money is I'm improving your life. Uh, that would be unusual, it's, uh, more in the, uh, something under 10000 five, 7000 range. Um, in addition, if you want to sign up for my blog, um, this one that I enclosed in here, actually I did not write. I have uh, uh, some attorneys that I meet with uh, a number of times annually and uh, uh, nationwide, and they wrote, that I, I stole that. I called them up and said, can I steal this? This was about the new uh, Social Security card and Medicare card that's coming out. Um, 
if you would critique me, I'd appreciate that. I have done public speaking for a long time, and because of feedback from people like you, uh, I continue to improve, or certainly work toward improving. Uh, so that would be a help to me. And anything else you want to indicate, that would be super. If you turn that into Terry, Terry will give you a million dollars. You can give it to your kids, your grandkids, throw it on the sidewalk, see what happens. Um, but I think they're fun. So, is there, do you have any questions for me that I could answer before I go through these things? Yes. So one question I have is if you are alone, but you have a companion, a significant other, and you have one of those LAT situations, living apart together where you have your own places, but you're committed, you're in a committed relationship. Will we, if we meet with you, learn how to make it so that they inherit stuff? Because we have no piece of paper that says we're connected. Right. The question is, if you're, if you're living, you have a significant other, a partner that you really uh, appreciate, but you're not married for who cares what reasons, yes, it's possible to set up a combined estate plan that you can protect one another. But you have to do it in writing, because otherwise, if you have nothing, then again, we're into opening up the Idaho Code and figuring out where the property is supposed to go. So yes, that's possible to do. And sometimes I have even married couples uh, that the, the one spouse won't do a thing, and the other spouse, you know, just because they're a curmudgeon, like my father-in-law, and, and, or they just don't feel it's necessary. And, and then I can work with just the single spouse. You know, it limits what you're doing. And this is kind of detail for me. If I had a condo that was an extra condo to the one I live in, and so I have to pay the full tax property tax on it, um, is there an advantage to giving my significant other that condo? Because right now my significant other rents. I, I can't answer that question with asking you lots more questions. Because yeah, I was wondering if there's an advantage to giving him the condo, and then later, if if I am, if he dies and I get it. He writes it for me to inherit. Yeah, the question of, of do you give a condo to a friend and, and is that smart to do, that's, yeah. that's, uh, there are dozens of questions that I would have to ask you okay. before I could answer that. Thank you. But uh, yes, sir, go ahead. If the only will I've ever done was 33 years ago, is that one still in effect? Uh, yeah, the question is if you did a will 33 years ago, is it still in effect? Sure. If it was done properly at the time, it, at that time, uh, it met the laws of the state where you drafted that will, yeah, then it's still effective. So the ex-spouse still is on it then? Well, uh, if, if you have an ex-spouse, there's laws that say if you got divorced after you signed the will, that spouse doesn't get it. But if you left the ex-spouse, you know, because you got divorced. So if you said, my wife, Sally, gets this money, and you're divorced, she's not getting the money. But if you, on your life insurance, left Sally as the beneficiary, she'll get the life insurance. Same thing on the pension benefits, so you need to be careful about that. Let me quickly go through these, and then I'll answer any other questions. Um, Health care and assisted living when you can't help yourself. You know, this is all planning. This is what this is all about. So you need to... That's what I was talking about, the goal planning. Okay, so if you can't live in your home for the rest of your life independently, and you want to stay in your home, how are you going to manage that? Are you going to pay for caregivers and how, where are they going to stay? Are they going to stay in your home or are they going to come in on eight-hour shifts? Or I have people that uh, uh, some of my clients have moved to the terraces because it's a continuing living place. And that means you have independent living and then you pay them a bunch of money in the beginning and then if you need some more care, you move into assisted living. And then if you really need more care, you end up in skilled nursing care. And there are places like Meadow Lake. Um, uh, they don't have the skilled living level, but they have the others. So there's lots of arrangements you can make, but you just have to be conscious about it and talk to your professionals, your financial people and your family or whomever you're relying on. And if you don't have people to rely on, that's fine. A lot of people in this world are like that. And there are professionals who really do a great job of filling, fill those gaps. Protecting your assets, we've talked about that, and part of it is planning. I mean, if you plan ahead of time and you know who's in charge and what you want to have done, that's going to save tons of money, and, and even more than that, tons of hassle and effort on the part of the people who are supposed to step up and help you. You're trying to, I was just going to say, you're trying to make it easy. If you plan and they know who, who's supposed to step up, it's going to be much simpler, and it's going to be more to your liking. Um, 
it w does a will work? Yeah, a will works fine. A will is dealing with death, okay? When you're dead, who gets your property and who's in charge? And, and if those people aren't available, who are the backups to them? So it will happen the way you want, and, which is great. It's a lot better than no will at all. But there are other variations. If you truly want to avoid going through a con the potential for conservatorship and guardianship, there's some steps that we have to talk about specifically to try to m make that not less of a possibility. Um, the inheritance tax, we threw that out the window because nobody cares anymore. Uh, the last thing I read, they expect this year there'll be approximately 1,000 death tax returns filed in the United States. 1,000 for, what do we have, 300 million people living in this country? I and mean, that just seems, it's, that's why I said nobody cares. The capital gains tax on the house sale, when you are alive, if you sell your home, the first, if you're married, the first 500,000 in gain is not taxed, and if you're single, it's 250,000. If you drop over dead, there is no capital gains tax when the house gets sold, because remember, it gets a step up in basis. Same thing for your rentals. Uh, not being a burden and your family being far away. Well, that's, the, that's all this planning stuff in terms of having people that you can trust that are gonna step up and, and deal with it. So if you call somebody at two in the morning and say, I th you know, last time I had food poisoning, which thank God was uh, quite a while ago, I just thought being dead is better than having food poisoning, you know, and, and thank God it finally all went away, but you know, who can you call at two in the morning to say, come help me? And that's really going to show up. And if you don't have somebody there, we can fill that gap. Um, uh, when to stop the medical testing? Boy, that's a conversation you have to have with your physician. And, and if the physician's not giving you a straight line, then um, you might find another physician if you can find another physician. There are other, the other thing is there are healthcare advocates who, again, you can hire to help you with that. Um, uh, so that, you know, and, and you're not incompetent. When you say, uh-uh, I'm not having that test. And I remember on the news right now, they say, you know, chemotherapy isn't necessary for, chemotherapy is like worse than the disease for cancer. It sounds to me like a lot of my friends who've had that. You know, you can say, no, I, no, I refuse that treatment. And they can't throw you in, you know, um, Blackfoot for being demented. I mean, it's a choice you, uh, you can certainly make, even though they make, make you feel small. Where to live, that's your choice. That's the fun part about being a mostly grown up. That's what I am, I'm mostly grown up. I never wanna be a full one. You know, you get to decide where you wanna live, and, but you just need to make the rational decisions, hopefully rational ones, about is this appropriate for you? One of the problems of staying at your home for the rest of your life is if you become less mobile, or your friends die or move away, or your family it disappears, you know, they've all kind of moved away, you get isolated. And a lot of people, are, I mean, some people are loners, but most people aren't that much of a loner, so you need to consider that, how to, how to be able to get around people. The will versus the trust, they both work. They just depends on your circumstances. That's the fun part about my business. This is not a cookie cutter thing. When we sit down and talk with everybody, what it really is this first thing. Where are you and what do you want to accomplish? And then how can we make that fit? How can we come up with a plan? Um, so sometimes uh, it, it becomes clear which one's better. By the way, when you sign a trust, you just don't sign a trust. You still sign all these other papers. You sign a new deed to put that in the property, uh, the property in the trust. You sign a will when you sign a trust because I don't follow you around. And like I said, I've got these clients I've had for decades and they sell their home that was in the trust and they buy a new home and it never crosses their mind to put it in the name of the trust and then they die. And now I have a dead person's name on a titled asset. So we have to probate that estate and put it in the trust. So that's why you still sign other papers with that. Long-term care. Long-term care is a serious problem that truly most people ignore with that paper bag over their head. Because it's just too overwhelming and, and I'm feeling great today, so what do I care? If you look at that uh, uh, poster over there, another attorney friend of mine uh, did that and told me that he was happy for me to use it. And it just talks about the progression of getting older. I don't know why we have to talk about it. Just look at your friends and relations. You know, you're on, we're all on this conveyor belt of life. People fall apart and it just, it's a tragedy, but it's the way it is. Um, you have a 5% chance of dying in bed. 
I'm signing up for that. That's what I want. That's what we all want. But 5%, that's pretty crummy. So this is realistic to look at. So you need to say, how can I live independently? And how can I arrange for the care I need whenever that happens? The assets going where you want, that's easy. Just plan and write the plan down. Just don't talk about it. The oral explanations don't make it happen. I had a family bring in to me after the mom and dad died, they brought me a video and they said, I want you to watch this video because dad did it and dad said, this painting goes to Sally and this ring goes to George and this table saw goes to Sam. And I said, you know, that's interesting. I'm not going to watch the video and you might want to keep it as family history, but it's garbage. The legal system doesn't deal with it that way. You really have to write these things down and then it'll go the way you want it to. So uh, on this, for that kind of stuff, you write a list. It says who gets the ring, who gets the table saw and all that. The veterans benefits, as I described, they are wonderful, but the veterans benefits are very difficult to access for many people. And in addition, the poor veterans administration uh, they're a mess. Every time they show up on the news, it's all bad publicity. Uh, when I, I've, I'm certified for, with the Veterans Administration, which meant I had to go take some more tests and, and learn more, which is great. I'm happy to do that. But when I went to take the, uh, uh, get that information, I went to Georgia. And um, they brought in, as a speaker, uh, the director of the Georgia Veterans Administration. And he was a brand new one because what had happened is in the past, people would bring in their applications for different veterans benefits, and they had understaffed the local veterans office. So what the staff was finally doing is they'd take it, and then they'd walk out the back door and throw those in the dumpster, which is like, oh, this is really not a good way to run an office. I guess you could say, well, they were so overwhelmed they couldn't deal with getting more work coming in the front door because they couldn't deal with the work they had, but that just doesn't seem to me an appropriate way to run things. And the Veterans Administration, you know, it's just a tiny example, but they obviously have some difficulties with their staffing. Um, and so when you make an application through the Veterans Administration, it often takes at least a year for it to be processed. They also do paper instead of computer stuff, so things get lost. So it's just not a very efficient system, but once you get through the system, the benefits can be very generous. So are there other questions that you have before I wind this up? Cool. I hope I haven't overwhelmed you with information. It's certainly been my pleasure to share this with you today. I hope this has been a help to you. For those of you that are uh, on the webinar, uh, if you would fill out that evaluation form and send that in to, uh, you've got instructions on how to do that, send that into my office, that would be great. And thank you. Thank you for taking your morning to spend with me. I appreciate that. You're welcome.